Jesus, come join us in our journey as we seek your will for this community and this environment. Teach us to love each other as you love us, to give ourselves as you give yourself, that the kingdom of God might be made present to all. Amen. Amen. Be seated. During the final week of Jesus' ministry here, this episode took place between he and his disciples. Again, the reading from the gospel. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still, not, still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pangs. Whoa, Jesus. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, Mark 13 is comprised of these different sayings of Jesus, which the evangelist is addressing to his own community, either just before or after 70 A.D., the time of the destruction of the temple and the siege of Jerusalem. The context of the discourse immediately after Jesus and his disciples leave the temple, in conjunction with his prediction of its destruction, offers a strong clue for understanding how Mark's readers would have interpreted the passage. This morning's colic gives us a reason for paying attention to this dire piece of news from the Gospel of Mark. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This particular collect gives us an insight into the purpose of the Holy Scriptures and the purposes of the publisher. It reveals to us that all Holy Scriptures have been written for us that we may learn the intent of Almighty God for us and our relationship to him. The portion of the Old Testament Scriptures we heard this morning is a portion of Scriptures that is called apocalyptic. When I first heard that word apocalypse, it was in the context of the four horsemen of the apocalypse from the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. They were associated with war, famine, pestilence, and death. I also record that movie about the Vietnam War called Apocalypse Now. It was a high-tech flashback of someone's worst nightmare about the war. The word definitely has a bad connotation as far as I was concerned. But in the study of scripture, I was to learn that the Greek word apocalypsis means disclosure or revelation. So the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ is really a book of the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. The opposite of apocalypse is apocrypha, which means hidden. That portion of the scripture that originated in the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament is called the books of the apocrypha. They were hidden and not recognized as canonical by the Hebrew scholars, and as a result, by the Protestant theologians of the Reformation. They too decided not to recognize them. So most of our Bibles do not have the Apocrypha. However, the Catholic Bibles, Anglican Bibles, and the Orthodox Bible have them in there. The book of Daniel comes from the same period of history, but as one of the last books to be recognized by the Hebrew scholars and thus included in the canon of scripture, some scholars believe the book of Daniel was written during the period of the persecution of the people of Jerusalem and Judah by the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Antiochus was determined to make all the people of his kingdom follow his way of worship. A particular interest was the Israelites in Jerusalem, who seemed to be equally determined to maintain their brand of worship. Antiochus stripped the temple in Jerusalem, all its silver and the gold, set up a heathen altar in the temple, sacrificed pigs on it, burned all the scriptures he could find, killed anyone found with the scriptures, forbid the custom of circumcision and killed any Jews who disobeyed. Now, this book, like the book of Revelation, which was written during the period of persecution, was written in cryptic signs and symbols 
to encourage those who were enduring the persecution. Their purpose was and is to encourage all those who were and are being persecuted for their faith and their beliefs. As it says in the traditional version of this morning's collect, by patience and comfort of thy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. The words are written to reveal the love that God has for those who love him and obey him and trust in him. But above all, it's a message of hope to endure persecution. So let me paraphrase the psalmist as he sets the theme of that. Set the Lord always before you, for he is at your right hand, and you shall not fall. Let your heart, therefore, be glad, and let your spirit rejoice, for your body shall rest in hope. The message of faith, hope, and love is the backbone of the 13th chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, sometimes known as the love chapter in the Bible. But that only covers a third of the trilogy that Paul speaks about in most of his letters. Besides love, there's faith and there's hope. Our lessons this morning talk about the hope that is needed when enduring suffering and in persecution. We also have to understand that the hope we desire comes only through the faith and the love we have for God as we trust in him. The psalmist continues, you will show us the path of life for in his presence there is fullness of joy and in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Ain't that great? Can you imagine the joy to be in the presence of the most high God when every tear will be wiped away from every eye forever, when every trial and tribulation shall be eliminated, that day is quite a ways off. Just how far, we can't be sure, because as Jesus said later in the discourse, but of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So we got some doctrinal points we can draw from these lessons. First one, the Christian community must undergo the sufferings of the present age in order to have the glory in the future. Despite the destruction of the temple and constant distress, no war, famine, persecution, in the present, the end of the world is not at hand. Just as Jesus had to undergo suffering and death before entering into glory, so must the Christian church endure the same. Point number two, while none can predict the end, none will miss it either. The end of history is associated with the glorious coming of the Son of Man. Cosmic signs will precede this, which will be unmistakable. When this will occur, no one knows but the one who is in the charge of history, the Father, if only he knows, clever calculations and misguided frenzy are a waste of time. Number three, the final unfolding of God's ultimate purpose is revealed in the coming of the Son of Man. For the Christian community, God's purposes will be greeted as the summer is eagerly awaited and greeted with joy by school children. You know how that goes. Summer's here. Woohoo! <laughs> so in the same way, we will greet Jesus. So when we are uncertain of when these events will come into pass or when we are already enduring trials and troubles on account of our faith or beliefs, we have no recourse except to trust in the words of St. Paul as he wrote to the church at Rome. Paul writes in chapter 5, Therefore, since we are justified by faith and have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which he has given us. There, in a nutshell, is why and the wherefore for some of the suffering and persecution we encounter. It isn't pleasant to go through suffering and anguish and pain. While we're in the midst of us, we can lose sight of it in the presence of God and through it and all of us all mixed up in it. But he is with us. In all trials and all troubles, he is Emmanuel, God with us. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews reminds us that there is another purpose behind all this. He writes, for you have need of endurance so that you may do the will of God and receive what is promised. So ultimately, we have to keep reminding ourselves that the purpose of our being is to glorify God and do his will. As long as we are willing to do that, what Paul wrote to the Romans will apply. Paul said, we know that in everything, God works for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. The times we live in today certainly don't qualify as days of persecution for Christians. 
Well, maybe. Unless you live in certain countries in Africa, Asia, or the Middle East. But we are facing very uncertain times as it relates to the future of the country, the state, county, the city, and the church for that matter. The COVID-19 pandemic, political discord, the rampant crime and mayhem in the streets, strife on the border, wild effects of climate change, and impending e economic potential disaster. Well, there's a need for an anchor, a rock to be grounded upon, or a firm foundation. I turn to Paul again as he says to the church at Rome, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instructions that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. We turn to Holy Scriptures for the revelation of God's purpose and will for us in our lives. When we seriously study scripture, as the colleague says, inwardly digest them, we come to know God's purpose for us and as a church. When we pray, we talk to God. When we study his scripture, we allow him to talk back to us. It's an opportunity to talk to us and to reveal to us his plans and his ways. In these uncertain times, we do have hope in the future at St. Augustine's. The apocalypsis of Jesus Christ in the life of those here at St. Augustine's has been through the relationships and the interactions of many people who have been here and been a part of this community. The relationship we have with God cannot be attained or maintained without relationships that we have with each other. Many years ago at St. Albans here in Augusta, we had a Faith Alive weekend. And during that weekend, we got a pamphlet with materials titled, The True Function of a Christian Church. It was written by John Hoos of Trinity Parish in New York City. He studied the qualities of the first church in Jerusalem as outlined in the book of Acts of the Apostles. And he noted five things. First of all, it was a fellowship which had a soul-shaking personal experience with Jesus Christ, living, walking, working, talking, eating, and even arguing with him. Jesus had stamped himself daily upon the, mouth of the disciples' minds. Number two, it had a genuine, you know, genuineness in its trust in God through Christ. It was a believing fellowship, and its belief was so powerful that it was willing to commit its ways in confidence to God. Number three, it knew itself to be a spirit-filled community. The Holy Spirit had come. Nothing was now impossible. The task of the parish was to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world. Number four, it had a glad awareness of the forgiveness of sins. Trusting God through faith in Christ brought with it a remarkable new sense of being free. The burdens of anxiety and dread and guilt were lifted from the believer's heart. And number five, it placed very little value on any organization or activity which did not contribute directly to three important things. Those were worship, teaching, and the collection of alms for the needy brethren. Being a member of the fellowship did not mean committee work. It meant a changed relationship to God. The same thing applies here. We are the body that comprises that portion of the church here at St. Augustine's. Do we exhibit the marks of a true church as outlined by John in his article? If not, then what can we do to make every effort to increase the meaningfulness of our worship and our prayer life to empower us to become Christ bearers and win our environment for Christ? As I said when I say again, when we gather as a community for corporate prayer and worship, do we leave here pumped up to carry Christ to the world? or not, we should be holding fast with our blessed hope of everlasting life. We should also be asking ourselves the following questions. What is the real mission and purpose of St. Augustine's? How can all that is done in this church advance that mission? To what extent is everything we are doing changing the lives of the people involved? Number four, how will we know we are following Jesus? when we can see his back in front of us. Now you're following him. As we look to the future, no matter how uncertain it may be, let us be steadfast in our desire to be an apocalypsis of Jesus Christ as a church today and as a body and as individuals in our daily lives. So when our Lord comes again in power and might, he will say to us at St. Augustine's, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your Lord. These words I have spoken in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen.